Welcome back. The 7th World Internet Conference was held in Wuzhen in eastern China's Zhejiang province. It is one of China's most important tech conferences. As the majority of the world's economies took a hit from the COVID-driven recession, the Internet and the digital technology have become powerful tools for countries to engineer an economic recovery. To what extent has the global health crisis catalyzed the digital industrial revolution? What are the potentials and pitfalls of our digital future? For more insight, I'm joined by Zhang Fen, the Associate Professor at Beijing Normal University via Skype from Bangkok, Jeffrey Towson, host at Jeff's Tech Asia class, and by phone, Professor Shen Yi, the Director of the International Institution of Cyberspace Governance Research at Fudan University. Um, Mr. Shen, let me go to you first. You were at a conference, as I understand. So fill us in. What's your takeaway from this year's conference? This year's conference is very special. That's the conference that uh, after China is quite successfully dealing with the threat of this COVID-19 and find uh, quite practical patterns to take advantage of all these digital technologies to counter in the economic recessions uh, after these pandemic issues and the launch of quite a successful uh, economic recovery in these months. And during this conference, there's a lot of case uh, help people to understand to which extent these digital economies can help people uh, during this fund uh, count, uh, funding against these pandemic things. Uh, it can assist the, the doctors more efficiently to ensure whether the guy is influenced by this COVID-19 uh, virus. And also it helped a lot for millions of people all around China to recover their economic lives after these pandemic issues. Uh, help people to launch remote communication, education, digital online ec economic activities so that their lives can get in better even under the threat of this COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. Yeah, Professor Zhang, uh, let me turn to you. Conferences like this brought together policymakers, regulators, as well as businesses and entrepreneurs. So on the policy side, uh, what do you expect China's regulators to do uh, with the digital economy? I mean, where is the sweet spot um, between government regulators and really uh, businesses and entrepreneurs in this digital sector? That's the uh, perennial question, isn't it? Um, so, very recently there has been news of the uh, tightening uh, regulations as imposed by the, uh, by the Chinese regulators, especially in terms of anti-monopoly laws. So, a lot of people interpreted that as sort of a uh, uh, tightening the screw on the t digital economy, telling the, uh, the, the technology companies whose boss they can't just do whatever they want. But actually, in reality, um, China has been loosening up the regulations quite a bit. Uh, for example, it's turning to negative lists. Uh, so basically saying anything that's not forbidden is, is allowed. So for innovative economy, that's quite important. Also, that works for a foreign investment as well. So that's a brilliant, brilliant idea to be doing. And in the future, I think some things that needs to be done more, that's already ha happened in the past, is that the Chinese regulators tend to work quite closely with the industry. They do actually consult the industry on what, whenever a new technology comes up, they ask what kind of things they should ban not right. That would be very dangerous for, uh, be very help harmful for this type of new economy uh, if it's allowed. And then they also ask for um, what kind of headroom do people want. Uh, to be able to explore a little bit. Um, that, that I've, I've seen that happen uh, in person, and then uh, I think that should become a regular thing. And also I think that the regulators should adopt a more smart, intelligent uh, method as well um, in terms of using technology, using maybe AI, maybe um, sort of simulations either on computer or using people setting up sort of companies to predict what kind of new regulatory um, changes that's needed to adapt to new technology because technolo technology is, is improving really, really fast and the regulators really need to catch up or, or just in, in keep in pace, otherwise they will become a hindrance. And then Professor John, what about concerns for privacy? I mean, what you suggested sounds great to me, but uh, some would say, you know, my privacy would be subject to uh, government regulators and the government would become almighty. Um, so your privacy has or always been sort of, uh, there's no absolute privacy. I mean, your phone information is, is always, in whatever country, however they, they publicize it, 
they always have the capability to just go to the telecommunication companies and ask for your information. Um, so, so the conspiracy theories like uh, vaccines tracking people, that's completely nonsense. People, governments can do that much easier to do other things. Um, the thing about privacy, in my opinion, and that's um, one thing that really sets China apart is that China, Chinese people's attitude towards privacy it's a little different um, in the sense that in the past, privacy protection hasn't been that great, for better or for worse. So people are used to having their information supposed to be private. For example, your ID card number. It's like a social security number, but for some reason, you have to give it e everywhere. Um, what Chinese people care about is whoever misuse their information, at least for some people, like myself, is that whenever some people misuse that information, they get caught really, really quickly. So it's, so it's a deterrence thing. It's, it's sort of an honor system uh, backed up with real capability of punishing the, the offenders. Um, so, so Chinese people tend to be less inclined to just jealously guard their, their, their private information in a safe and not giving it to anybody. So, so that's kind of important for the digital economy, actually, in my, in my right, opinion. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, let me turn to you in Bangkok. A Chinese government announced, uh, you proposed guidelines to regulate uh, the internet sector, the e-commerce sector. Um, I mean, there has always been debate about how much government is too much. Uh, what do you think? Where do you think is the sweet spot? I think we can distinguish between countries like China and the U.S. that are fairly entrepreneurial. So you, you can see the government operating with a couple of interests. One is to curb excesses and things that you know, are emerging quickly that are not uh, appropriate, but also trying not to stifle innovation uh, because there is a lot of interesting stuff going on. The, the example I always like to point to is these Mobike and Ofo bike sharing companies you know, there's, there's almost no country in the world that would let a private company put millions of bikes on the street just randomly uh, just to let it run for a little while, to you know, not stifle it too much, and then eventually a couple years later to come in and start to regulate it. Most every other country would have stopped that on day one. So you, you just see this balancing between encouraging innovation uh, but curbing excesses as they emerge. I think China has actually done quite a good job on that e-commerce, some major uh, regulations there, recent issues regarding credit and Ant financial, I thought were very prudent. Um, gaming, some other things. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing because most of what's emerging, it's new. I mean, there's no precedent. Uh, we're just dealing with new capabilities all the time. That's sort of the story of our age. Uh, Mr. Shen, let me turn to you again. Uh, President Xi Jinping addressed the opening ceremony of this uh, conference in Zhejiang, and uh, some of the key words uh, in his speech include that the digital cooperation, information revolution, new drivers of development, and shared future. He also talked about uh, digital cooperation with other countries. I mean, what specific solutions uh, when it comes to digital cooperation did you hear uh, from the conference? I think that uh, uh, since the second uh, in the conference in Wuhan, uh, Xi Jinping made his initiations that we should build a shared destiny, shared destiny, destiny communities in the global cyberspace. And uh, since then, uh, China moving uh, step by step in each conference. In this year, the conference focusing on how to launch uh, practical uh, consolidated corporations to launch effective cooperation among uh, states to fighting against the pandemic things to share this information about how to counter the virus, uh, how to fund or uh, to deliver China's quite effective digital solutions to help people to doing that, and also try to find out proper ways to cooperation among the digital economy aspect, uh, encouraging people, uh, the countries, to launch uh, new regulations uh, to regulate the trans uh, cross-border data fellows to ensure the quantity and efficiency that people can I uh, the both uh, on one side to take good advantage of these digital economies, on the other side, uh, quite efficiently protect the necessary interests, including national security, uh, privacy of individual peoples, and all other things. In uh, short, in this conference, this year's conference, they're trying to focus in more, more on the detailed uh, uh, aspect to use these uh, ICT revolution issues to uh, empower peoples and empower the state during these digital ages. 
Right. Professor Zhang Fan in Beijing, how do you see digital cooperation between China and other countries becoming a reality? Uh, well, I think, I think that the regulation internet governance thing would be, a, would be quite important foundational stage uh, in terms of pushing forward the, uh, the collaboration. Because I think collaboration, first, the scope for collaboration is massive because China is really good with infrastructure and China is really good with uh, poverty alleviation. And in China, those things are done. Currently, there's a new infrastructure drive on technology. And also, the, uh, the poverty alleviation, you know, you know the, uh, the smart, um, smart agriculture, uh, remote medicine, that's particularly useful for people in rural areas. So those will benefit people in the third world countries in, in, in other parts, parts of the world greatly. Uh, but for that to, to move forward, you, you sort of need to lay down the rules first. And I think the, uh, the, the, in the sort of internet governance uh, proposal being put forward, concentrating on cyber um, sovereignty, which means it's not the, com the companies setting the rules, it's not the countries where those companies originate set the rules, it's the country where the customers are set the rules. And also from multilateralism, where, which benefits smaller countries because they can help each other enforce the laws uh, in a multilateral setting. If it's just bilateral, then the weaker counterparty actually can't have no recourse to actually enforce whatever is in the treaty. Um, so I, I, I think what's, what's being put in the, um, in the proposal there is, is, quite, uh, is quite important. Right. Jeffrey, Professor Zhang talked about uh, cyber governance uh, and who really should have a bigger say in all this. Uh, should they be the government uh, or the businesses or individuals and customers? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, part of the problem is it's, it's really complicated. I mean, this, it's one thing to do governance of the roads and the street cleaning, which most people can understand, but there's actually very few people can, who can understand the intricacies of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, they do tend to work mostly in the private sector. So, you know, I would say maybe it's more a matter of collaboration. I mean, when an issue comes up, the private companies have to sit down with the government. But it's not probably possible for most countries to just create governance rules for something that's, you know, it's, it's very complicated and it's evolving very, very quickly. So it's not just understanding where it is, but understand where it's going. Uh, so I think right now we're going to see sort of a reactionary posture. For the most part, probably the private companies are going to lead and then the governments are going to respond uh, just because that is more workable although that's not perfect either. It's probably the most practical approach, at least for now. Uh, Professor Zhang, finally, we have about one minute left. Uh, what will be your advice uh, when you talk about or you think about uh, challenges for China's digital sector? Uh, what problems are there and how should they be overcome? Uh, I'll return to, well, actually, the uh, people talk about conversion of uh, new research into, 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 act, uh, into, into, into industry. Um, but that, that hasn't been going that smoothly. For example, uh, I, I know people, my collaborators, have been trying to commercialize their new discoveries, and they just simply have no, no formal place to go, and there's no help because they're researchers, they don't want to spend full time on it. Um, so, so some more formal nationalized uh, approach to, uh, to, to actually encouraging innovative IT industry would, would, be, would be quite good. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good to me. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Zhang, Associate Professor at Beijing Normal University, Jeffrey Towson, host at Jeff's Asia Tech Class, and Professor Sheng Yi, the Director of the International Institution of Cyberspace Governance Research at Fudan University. Thank you all so much, and that will do it for this edition of The Point. As always, follow us on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xing in Beijing, download the CGTN app, or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. I'm Wang Guan, and thank you on behalf of my team.